I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a surprising endorsement in San Diego's most contentious congressional race. Plus, AARP's National Convention starts this week in San Diego. Which celebrities will be there and how a new generation of 50-plus Americans are changing the face of aging. I'm Peggy Pico with that preview and a conversation with Nathan Fletcher about his new foundation to help local veterans. And a founding father of the San Diego jazz scene has died. We'll remember Daniel Jackson tonight. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce made a rare decision today endorsing a Democrat running for re-election in Congress. The candidate is San Diego Congressman Scott Peters. KPBS reporter Claire Trageser is following the story. She joins us from the newsroom. Claire, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it rare for the U.S. Chamber to endorse a Democrat? Yes, that's right. The U.S. Chamber is a business lobbying group that almost always endorses Republicans. In fact, in the 2014 election cycle, it endorsed more than 260 candidates and only four are Democrats. That includes its endorsement of Peters. And you went to the uh, Peters headquarters to talk about this uh, announcement and endorsement. Tell us what happened. Peters was surrounded by a group of local business owners at his campaign headquarters. He says the endorsement demonstrates he is a moderate candidate who can work with diverse groups. Uh, here's what he said. The facts speak louder than the rhetoric. Uh, and the fact is I'm proud to be the real independent, uh, the real problem solver, the real consensus builder. Uh, that's been my record, and I, I'm pleased that the chamber has noticed that. And tell us about the surprise appearance after the press conference today. Yes, uh, Dave McCullough, who's a spokesman for Peters' opponent, Carl DeMaio, waited outside the news conference and spoke to reporters in the parking lot. He dismissed the chamber as a special interest group, but then was asked whether DeMaio tried to get the chamber's endorsement. Here's what he said. Uh, well, Carl DeMaio doesn't change his opinions based on who, uh, who is endorsing him or who, uh, who he seeks to, to be endorsed. And uh, the, the special interests in Washington know that when Carl comes to Washington, that uh, he's going to take the perks away from, uh, from those special interests. Sounds like he didn't really answer the question. Did he ever give a response? Yes, I asked him again, and after a bit more throat clearing, he confirmed that DeMaio did seek the U.S. Chamber's endorsement. We've got more about the race online at kpbs.org slash election. KPBS reporter Claire Trageser. This is debate night for candidates in one San Diego City Council district. Chris Kate and Carol Kim are in a runoff for the 6th district seat representing Mira Mesa, Kearney Mesa, and Claremont. It's the only seat still up for grabs on the November 3rd uh, race. The uh, debate starts at 7 tonight at Mira Mesa High School. There will be um, only one debate in the California governor's race this election season, and you can watch it right here on KPBS tomorrow night. Jerry Brown will face Republican challenger Neil Kashkari at 7. The debate will be hosted by KQED's John Myers. You can watch it right here at 7 o'clock or listen to it at 89.5 KPBS-FM. The family of Junior Seau is saying no thanks to the proposed legal settlement between the National Football League and former players over concussion-related injuries. Instead, the family is proceeding with its wrongful death suit against the league. The Chargers Hall of Famer committed suicide in 2012. The family's lawyer says the settlement doesn't include value for the claims of Seau's children or for the loss of his companionship and future earnings. He also says the lawyer... It appears the league is opting for expediency and not a transparent solution. Under the settlement plan, the family could receive $4 million. The NFL is not commenting on their decision, but a lawyer for other players in the class action suit advises sticking with the plan rather than risk continued litigation. The nurse who filed a whistleblower lawsuit against San Diego Hospice could get as much as a million dollars in damages. Our media partner, iNewsource, got the word from Lori Raychak's attorney. She was fired in 2011. After working at the hospice for many years, she actually claimed it was admitting people into care who were not eligible. There was a two-year federal investigation, and the hospice is now closed. 
San Diego County is doing its part to prepare for the Santa Ana fire season now underway, urging neighbors in the rural backcountry to get ready as well. In May, San Diego County was hit hard by a series of wildfires, and this fall could even be tougher. Some of the biggest wildfires in state history have happened in our area during October. Both the 2003 and 2007 wildfires were fanned by strong, gusty Santa Ana winds, common during this time of year. County Supervisor Diane Jacob. Fighting fires takes boots on the ground. It takes aerial muscle, like helicopters and tankers. It also takes preparation for each and every one of us. So far this year, Cal Fire has responded to far more wildfires due to the state's prolonged three-year drought. San Diego County is doing its part. Since 2003, we've spent more than $285 million on fire protection improvements. And this month, they're beefing up aerial resources to get us through the peak fire season, adding a UH-1H Huey helicopter, the same kind used by CAL FIRE and similar to the ones used by the Sheriff's Department. Jacob says collaboration between public and private agencies has also been vital to enhancing the county's firefighting capability. But the region needs to step up its game even more as we prepare for the next major wildfire. The county is trying to get folks fired up about preparing for wildfires, promoting its Ready, Set, Go resource guide for, of tips for clearing brush and putting together an evacuation plan for the family. Downtown San Diego is getting another boardroom, but this one will be portable. The boardroom is the name of the winning design in the Downtown San Diego Partnerships Parklet Contest or Parklet Contest on Facebook. The designers will get 5,000 bucks from the city to build their temporary park. The contest is intended to bring new life to unused spaces. Former Assemblyman, San Diego mayoral candidate and veteran Nathan Fletcher launched a new organization this week. He talks with Peggy Pico about the Three Wise Men Foundation. Nathan Fletcher, welcome to Evening Edition. Thank you. Good to be with you. Yeah, no, you're a veteran. Uh -huh. um, however, this foundation, Three Wise Men, is actually named after three of your cousins. Tell yeah. us about that. You know, when I was a, uh, a little guy growing up, my closest friend was my cousin Jeremy Wise. Uh, and he had two younger brothers, Ben Wise and Bo Wise, and so we, we called them the Three Wise Men. And it was the three of them and me and my little brother. We all, we grew up together, we camped, we played. Uh, we all joined the military together. Um, and uh, there's this assumption when you're a child that you're going to live through life with your childhood friends. Um, but tragically, we lost Jeremy to a suicide bomber in Afghanistan in 2009. Uh, and then two years later, we lost Ben uh, in a firefight in Afghanistan. And so Bo Wise is now the sole surviving son. He's kind of saving Private Ryan. He remains on active duty in the Marine Corps. And it just hit me that of all the tragedies that we lose, the, the, the ones that we, we spend the most time on are those we lost in combat, Jeremy and Ben, but the focus needs to be on Bo those veterans who survived combat and making sure they can survive the peace. And that really is the point of the Three Wise Men Foundation is helping and, them. And that's my next question. You know, why did you start it? Is yeah. it to uh, help all veterans, a certain specific veterans? You know, when, it, when, I, when I hold and I'm around Jeremy and Ben's kids, you know, their, their boys are about the same age as my boys, and they're boys who will never know their dad. Uh, and when I'm around their, their mom, this is a mom who, who lost her children. It's heartbreaking and it's tragic. But it's not as tragic as, as the mom whose son survives combat and comes home and commits suicide, or the child who loses their parent to suicide. And so it really hit me that, that in America, we're losing between 22 and 50 veterans a day are killing themselves. And we have to do a better job. We have a moral obligation to these veterans to let them know that we care, to let them know that we love them, to let them know that they're, it's okay to struggle, uh, but they need to have the courage to call and ask for help. And, and they fought for us for years. And so this is our opportunity to now fight for them a little bit. Is it the mission of the foundation? Is it specifically focused on uh, suicide prevention? It is. Well, it's focused on returning veterans. So it's, it's three things. We want to raise awareness of the problem. So many Americans don't, aren't aware that we have this epidemic of veteran suicide. Uh, the second thing we want to do is directly reach the veterans. They're hard to reach when they leave active duty. And then we want to connect them. There's so many programs that are doing great work 
and we want to connect them to those programs and help facilitate that. And those are the three things we're going to focus on. And that brings me to th this next idea of how is this foundation different from the many organizations here in San Diego to help right. veterans? Well, we're here to partner with those organizations. So this year, for example, Courage to Call is a 2 on one 24-7 veteran staffed hotline that does great work. But they said, hey, we have a hard time getting veterans to, to call. And so we're going to help provide that bridge. We're going to raise awareness of the issues they face. We're going to reach directly to the veterans and then connect them to programs like uh, Courage to Call that are already out there. What do you think would help most San Diego veterans? Uh, what would maybe be the first step in helping them, uh, your foundation or getting them to a central place? Yeah. Do you have an idea? Well, I, I spent about the last year talking to leaders in the veterans community, talking to folks at the VA, talking to folks who run organizations and said, what, what, is, what is most needed? Uh, what, is, what, is most, what is most helpful? And really what came back to this was getting, getting to the veterans uh, with the direct mention of compassion and love and from a surrogate that they'll listen to, from someone who, else who served, and then connecting them to the programs that already exist. And they said that's where a lot of the breakdown is. And so our first event in October, uh, we're doing on the deck of the Midway, is a CrossFit-style competition that's hugely popular with veterans. We have a lot of athletes that are going to record public service announcements. We have entertainers and musicians. Uh, folks that veterans will listen to, and we're going to bring them out and say, look, you have the courage to fight for our country. Now you need to have the courage to call and ask for help. Come out to the Midway, hang out with some fellow veterans, be a part of a community, and get connected directly with those that will provide you the help. And is that also a fundraiser? That's the October fundraiser? That's or is right. that something different? No, that's the same. That's mm -hmm. a fundraiser. And the proceeds will go directly to organizations that are providing services directly to veterans. And then we're going to follow that up on Veterans Day. Veterans Day is the day, Memorial Day, we honor those who died. Veterans Day is the day we honor all of those veterans who lived. And so on Veterans Day, we're going to have a national movement. We're going to have similar events to that in all 50 states across the country. So every community can reach out to their veterans with a message of compassion and love, bring them in, bring in the service providers who are there and help connect them. And this uh, is a very ambitious uh, foundation. It looks like sure. it, as far as what you want to do. How is it funded? So we're going to be funded through donations. Uh, we, we've already secured a number of donations, and we're going to go out and, and we're going to you know, for years I, I, uh, I spent a lot of energy and effort raising a lot of money for a lot of things, uh, but this will probably be more important than anything I've ever done, and uh, I, I'm not shy at asking for help. All right. Three Wiseman founder Nathan Fletcher, thanks very much. Great. Good to be with you. Thanks. Tonight we remember two San Diego legends who died this week. The first is Charlie Powell, a 1952 graduate of San Diego High School who first played pro baseball then went into the NFL at age 19. At that time, he was the youngest player in the league. He became a pro boxer, too, taking on the likes of Muhammad Ali, then known as Cassius Clay. Powell turned down and offered to play basketball with the Harlem Globetrotters. He died Monday at Scripps Mercy Hospital. He was 82 years old. We also remember jazz man Daniel Jackson, a fixture and legend in San Diego on the San Diego jazz scene. He played the saxophone and piano in a career that lasted decades. He also served as a tutor and mentor to many local musicians. He died last night at the age of 77. KPBS arts reporter Angela Carone interviewed him last year. The first thing you see when you walk into Daniel Jackson's modest home is his piano. It's from the early 1900s and Jackson bought it for $100. The piano is getting tuned when we arrive. It's not great, but it'll, it won't disgrace you. Jackson picks up his first and everlasting love, the saxophone, to help tune the piano. Jackson is 76. He lives in the house he grew up in, which was built in 1902. In fact, it was here in this front room that Jackson heard the tenor saxophone for the first time. His brother was in a band with sax player Harold Land. I was still shooting marbles when he was playing. They often practiced at the house, and Jackson would hide around the corner and listen. When I heard this tenor saxophone, I was like, okay, that's it. That's where I want to be for the rest of my life, is on that sound. Jackson credits his mother, Johnny Beatrice Jackson, with helping him stay on that sound. Right above his piano is a black and white photograph of her, sitting straight and proud. She was a strong woman. I have a, a wealth of respect for any woman. But a woman in her, in her situation has really something. But she came through like a champion. 
Johnny Jackson lived with her husband and three children in the quarters, an area of La Jolla where black domestic workers lived. She was a maid and her husband a chauffeur. But after her husband died of throat cancer, Johnny moved her three kids to this house in southeast San Diego. She had a great job in front of her, and that was to raise three children, uneducated, and a black woman in white America. That was not easy. For many years, she managed to pay for Jackson's saxophone lessons on a maid's salary. Today, Jackson is considered a local legend, one of the founding fathers of San Diego's jazz scene. But Jackson did leave San Diego for short stints. In the late 60s, he toured Europe with the Ray Charles Band. Mother, you can look for my clothes home. Jackson says most people don't know it, but Charles was a brilliant saxophonist. I gave us a concert once, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was terrifying. And the saxophone looked like it was so hot, steam, heat was rising, and it was melting into these golden globes of tone. After that tour, Jackson returned to San Diego. But making a living as a musician has always been a struggle, even to this day. Jackson taught himself to play piano and got a gig playing six nights a week at the Hotel Del Coronado. Yeah, I never made that much money before in my life. Jackson still plays piano at Croce's downtown. He's been there for 30 years. As a young musician, one of Jackson's idols was the great saxophonist James Moody, who died in 2010. <laughs> Okay, this guy is my idol. He's my idol so much that these guys around here in the neighborhood, they have a tendency to give these people all their neighbors and buddies and cousins and everything nicknames. So they're calling me Young Moody. Because I love his music so much and I'm trying to sound like him. Many years later, Moody showed up to watch Jackson play. The next day, they spent an afternoon hanging out at Moody's house in San Diego. At one point, Moody went upstairs and came back down with two grocery bags full of saxophone mouthpieces from all the years he'd been playing. He gave them to Jackson. That mouthpiece right there was in one of those bags. I found that mouthpiece and it was a good mouthpiece for me. It was later that Jackson discovered that Moody's name is etched into the brass mouthpiece. I told his wife that. I said, you know, James is always with me. Wherever I go, I play that horn, he's there. Jackson says he'll keep on playing music until he can't any longer. In his words, it's a labor of love and a quest to experience some part of divinity. Angela Carone, KPBS News. Good evening. I'm Suzanne Marmion, Director of News and Editorial Strategy here at KPBS. We'll be right back to KPBS Evening Edition. That's right. I'm Jansen Zink. Before we return to the intelligent news and analysis that you find on this program, we'd like to remind you how we pay for it. We receive money from the government, foundations, and businesses, but the largest and most critical share of our revenue comes from the contributions of our viewers. Viewer support gives us the financial independence that shields our news department from outside influences. Thanks to your support, our reporters don't answer to anyone but you. We're in the middle of Fund Your Favorites Week on KPBS. Please do your part to support it. Go to kpbs.org and click Give Now or call 1-800-576-KPBS. Contribute to KPBS today and support Fund Your Favorites Week. Sign up as a sustaining member at the $5 a month level or give $60 all at once. In return, we would love to thank you with the KPBS Corkscrew and Wine Stopper. This two-piece stainless steel set comes in a wooden box emblazoned with the KPBS logo. Right now, when you support Fund Your Favorites Week on KPBS with a contribution of $45, we can thank you with the KPBS Canvas Tote Bag. This tote comes in tan, with red handles, and the KPBS logo on the side in black. Go online to kpbs.org and click the blue Give Now button, or call 1-800-576-5727 to make your contribution now. From elections to the economy, border policy, art, scientific discoveries, and more. If it happens in San Diego, if it matters to San Diegans, then you'll find it on KPBS Evening Edition.
You're not going to find frivolous stories and inane banter on our program. When you turn on the news, you're not looking for sensational crimes in other states or the latest goofball YouTube video. You want deep analysis from experts in the field. You want to know about the stories that affect you and the community where we live. With KPBS Evening Edition, that's exactly what you get. And you get it all in just 30 minutes. Please remember that this kind of journalism doesn't come for free. Your support makes this program a reality. And that's what we're asking for right now. Please make a contribution in any amount. It's so easy to give. Just go to kpbs.org and click Give Now, or call us at 1-800-576-KPBS. Don't forget, it's Fund Your Favorites Week on KPBS. If you've ever wished that we'd air fewer fundraising specials and more of our regular shows, then this is your week to give. This week, we're airing Independent Lens, Nature, Nova, Frontline, Great Performances, and so many other shows instead of the typical fundraising programs. However, we still have a critical goal, $50,000 by Sunday night. Please take a moment to support your favorite programs right now. You'll be done in just two minutes. All you have to do is go to kpbs.org and click Give Now or pick up the phone and call us at 1-800-576-5727. I'm KPBS General Manager Tom Carlo. I want to invite you to become a member of the KPBS Producers Club and join the more than 700 families who get special benefits at this level. A $1,200 a year investment in the KPBS Producers Club supports the quality programming and news that you've come to expect from us. But you'll also receive special invitations for exclusive events, a tour of KPBS by me, and opportunities to meet the personalities you've come to know on radio, TV, and the web. Please call 1-800-576-5727 to become a member of KPBS's Producers Club. We're about to go back to KPBS Evening Edition. If you've made a contribution during this break, then thank you very much. Now, if you haven't had a chance to give yet, then please take two minutes right now to support this, this station that puts serious journalism on television for you. We look forward to hearing from you. And now, let's return to our program. AARP's National Convention is being held this week in San Diego. Peggy Pico finds out what's new for the 50-plus crowd. Founded back in 1958 as the American Association of Retired Persons, the AARP's new ad campaign challenges stereotypes of what the organization does and what it means to be 50 and older in the U.S. Here with the latest is AARP President Janine English, and welcome to Evening Edition. Thank you. Now, AARP has clearly evolved over the last 56 years. What's the organization's main objectives? So our main objective is to let people over 50 have the tools to live their best life with dignity and purpose. And so that means financial resilience. That means having a healthy life and also being able to now answer their, their question of what's next for them. Well, I know we've heard 50 is the new 40 and so on, 40 is the new 30. So what has AARP actually identified as some of these specific interests uh, for those members or for people over age 50? Well, many people don't want to be in the rocking chair retiring like we you know, would have looked at our grandparents or our great-grandparents. What they want to do is they want to do something new. Many people, uh, I think one in six of our uh, members have said that they would like to start a new business. So we are helping them really identify what's next. And, and I know at the convention, actually, you have uh, very specific uh, ideas for that, that, it, that you got from the members, correct? If you could touch on a little bit of that. Exactly. So one of the things that we're doing is we're providing information about living a healthy lifestyle. Also, financial resilience. And it's not just Social Security. Social Security is important, but it's also the tools that allow you to save and allow you to provide that financial security for that longer lifespan. And then also, you know, what's next? If you want to start a new business, we will provide uh, the people involved to do one-on-one -on -one mentoring to help you put together a, 
a plan for whether that business will be successful and how to get into it. So the whole what's next component is uh, a kind of a new area for us, but it's so important to our members. And I know uh, AARP is said to have a great deal of political influence. What are some of the key political issues that AARP uh, either goes to bat for or is involved in? Well, we continue to look at and make sure that Medicare and Social Security will be there. Uh, for our children and our grandchildren. And that doesn't mean to just take Medicare and Social Security and look at it from a budget deficit, but to look at it to make sure that it's whole and it provides the kinds of resources. But then we also look at um, ways for people to save, uh, ways for um, people to become more healthy, uh, different technology so that you can be healthy, walking programs or exercise programs or eat good eating programs. So uh, there's a whole gamut of opportunities for our members. And, and, and going back to uh, going back to DC, though, I want to make it clear: so you guys don't aren't uh, you don't support any particular politician? No, we are a nonpartisan organization. So we have specific is issues that our members have told us that they care about. We do polling of our members. We go out into the communities to make sure that we support those specific issues. Well, let's get back to the convention and the expo because there's some big names on the roster. I know Kevin Spacey is, is your keynote speaker it's, this year. But there's also, you, you have some other people, if you could tell us who they are, and you have something set up where people can actually talk to some of these celebrities. We do. We have something new this time. In addition to having um, a Martha Stewart come to speak, um, Joan London, a number of other individuals. We have what we call salons, and it will be a smaller, more intimate setting so that uh, people can talk to Martha Stewart and Joan London and some of the other folks. We also have the administrator for the Small Business Administration, and she's going to talk about how what you need to do to set up your own business and how to be successful in doing so. And I understand there's an interactive center. Is that part of the salon, or are there other things as far as technical things? Well, so we also have a major major events floor and so that will be very interactive. There will be different products and services and programs that they can be part of. And uh, who can join AARP and, and how much does it cost to be a member? So AARP, um, anyone over 50 can, can join. Um, the membership uh, varies depending on whether you have a one year or three year but basically it's $16 a year to be a member of AARP and then there are numbers of benefits you get, uh, including the magazine. And then uh, if you want to know about policies, we will send that information to you. All right, Janine English, president of AARP, thank you so much. And I want to let folks know that AARP's National Convention Ideas at 50 Plus starts Thursday, September 4th, and runs through the 6th at the San Diego Convention Center. For more information, go to kpps.org. We are getting a new warning about strong rip currents and even some minor flooding along our beaches from tomorrow right through Monday. Coastal temperatures will be mostly in the upper 70s into the weekend. We'll see a warming trend, though, for the Inland Valley. Uh, low 80s tomorrow, climbing to 90 by Saturday. Low to mid 80s expected in the mountains with plenty of sun, and desert temperatures will be well above 100. Tonight's stories can be found online at kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.